This has been an absolutely incredible trip to Ireland. Most of the time has been spent roaming around the western part of the country from my base here in Galway. I'm packing a lot into this video as I'll check out some of the main attractions in this beautiful city. There will also be trips to Connemara National Park and the Cliffs of Moher. We'll start though on Inishmore, the largest of the Aran Islands. There are a number of key features to see on the island, the most popular of which is a prehistoric cliffside defensive position known as Dun Angus. Hundreds of people visit the site each day, making the effort to climb the hill where the site is situated. Today the remnants of the fortress are perched on the edge of a cliff 300 feet directly over the water. At the time it was constructed, Dun Angus was considerably farther from the ocean as sea level was much lower at that time. When exactly it was built is up for debate, but archaeologists say people have been living at the site since 1500 BC. The fort was likely constructed in the Bronze or Iron Age, with it being most prominent in the period from 1 to 2 BC. This entire enclosure covers 14 acres with four concentric defensive walls plus stone slabs placed on edge on the outside to add another layer of protection. Some have called this the most magnificent barbaric monument in all of Europe. Those who visit would probably agree. Views are stunning, the landscape, I mean you can see for miles today, so it's just, it's a gorgeous day. And the reflections yeah. of the water and you don't, don't see this everywhere in the world. The views are phenomenal, you've got the gorgeous cliffs, a beautiful day like this, I'm already neat. It's just a great experience, beautiful experience, so can't ask for anything more. The day I visited could not have been better. Views extended for miles and visitors enjoyed the ability to take in this amazing piece of history. Since Dun Angus sits right at the cliff's edge, many people like to go as close as they can to the drop-off. That's not really my thing, but I understand the appeal. It's terrifying, but amazing. <laughs> Did you have any qualms about doing it? No, actually. I would just had to do it safely. It costs five euro to access the site, and I would say it is definitely worth the price. One cool feature is that, like the cliff's edge, nothing is shut off by a barricade. People can investigate the entirety of the ruins, making the visit their own. More and more places, like, like slightly remote, uh, more and more becoming more accessible. It's brilliant because, you know, it means that people get to explore and untap the beauty. The space is actually large enough that it's possible to have a private experience and almost forget that you were sharing the site with several hundred others at the moment. Almost. The peace and quiet you get is, is phenomenal. Well, you got to share it with a few other people. Share but... a couple people, not too much, no. No doubt this is the most popular spot for individuals who are making a day trip to Inishmore to see. From the line of people snaking up the hill to folks swarming the interior of Dun Angus, there is no denying that this is a crowded place. Still, that shouldn't overshadow the ability to move over the grounds where others walked more than 3,500 years ago. Taking a moment to shut out the crowd and think of all that came before is priceless. I think when you just have a moment and you're sitting and you're reflecting, you start to think back on the history, and I think it just adds to the appeal of it. Dun Angus has been proclaimed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Not far away is another of the island's most impressive features. This is called the Wormhole. It is a rectangular cutout that would seem to be man-made, but it is 100% naturally occurring. Water rises and falls with the tides as chambers connect the wormhole to the sea. Diving and swimming are not encouraged here, but there are plenty who will take the opportunity. When I visited, there were just a handful of people in the area, which after visiting Dun Angus, added to the appeal. The lack of a crowd was in part because this is not an easy place to reach. I saw a few signs, but for most of the way, this was a cross-rock journey with little in the way of direction except for a general knowledge that the site existed. Inishmore could not have been a more charming island. The majority of people rented bikes in order to get around. Some walked, and some rode over the streets in horse-drawn carts. Just traveling the roads, there was so much to see. Horses and cattle were in their enclosures over much of the island. It was interesting to see the homes of some of the current residents as well. 
In many spots, older structures, which were abandoned long ago, sit as reminders of what used to be. Aran Island sweaters are a thing made from the wool of sheep grown in the region. There are a number of places on Inishmore where the sweaters, along with other items made of the wool, can be purchased. This one was adjacent to the Dun Angus Visitor Center. During warmer months, ferries leave directly from the dock in Galway to take passengers out to the islands. I went with Aran Island Ferries at a cost of around 50 euro. It started at 9.30 and we were back in port at around 6 o'clock. That included four and a half hours to explore the island. The trip to Inishmore took around an hour and a half. That was a little longer on the return because the excursion that I booked included the chance to see the famous Cliffs of Moher from the ocean. The boat spent about 15 minutes slowly cruising along the line of cliffs which reach an elevation of 700 feet. Quite a sight. I actually thought that seeing the cliffs from below would be enough for me since I'm not a big fan of heights. After others in my group decided to go see them from the top, however, I went along. I'm glad that I did. It's possible to walk both north and south from the visitor center and each direction provided astounding views. I had heard that walking south in the morning gave a better view of the cliffs being illuminated by the sun. That proved to be correct. Ultimately, I walked probably a kilometer in each direction and thoroughly enjoyed the experience. In most spots, there was a rock barrier that kept people from the edge of the cliff. In others, though, there was no such security. I never felt unsafe, though, and at one point, where the cliff's edge was very close to the path, I extended my camera arm in order to capture the view looking straight down. You're welcome. In terms of statistics, the cliffs stretch for almost five miles, and their highest point reaches 702 feet above sea level. The cliffs are more seem to be a real crowd pleaser. It's a greenery and a scenic beauty. It's a fantastic place to visit. I don't know exactly what to say. Uh, it's, it's really fantastic. Most people have seen photos and at least now video of the cliffs of Moher. Those ways of seeing this, however, cannot compare to being there in person. Most of the tourists who comes here, you know, I mean, they, they usually take the photos and all. We have seen the photos, but you know, we, we didn't really believe that, you know, when, when you come here, you know, it will be so much wonderful like this. One cool thing about the site is that buskers playing traditional music are scattered through the landscape. That soundtrack certainly adds to the experience. This again is a very popular place, so there will be others around when you are here. Most stay relatively close to the visitor center with the O'Brien's Tower area to the north, probably the most crowded location. The farther out in each direction from the visitor center, the fewer people there are. We got here on a two-hour public bus ride, which cost 20 euro for the round trip. Admission to the site was 7 euro booked online. It was more to pay at the gate. Another day trip that I took out of Galway was to the Connemara National Park. I booked that through the Wild Atlantic Way Day Tour Company. It cost around 40 euro. The appeal about choosing that particular tour company was that they gave you three full hours to enjoy the national park. The main attraction here out of the visitor center is Diamond Hill. You can actually climb all the way to the top. I'm taking just the lower portion though because I'm sort of limited on time. It's still a pretty good hike and, you know, as you can see, a little sweat, so it's not easy either. The full loop to the summit is around seven kilometers long and is said to take around two hours to complete. The hill is a little over 400 meters high. Based on how far up I got on the walk, I'm pretty sure I could have made it with plenty of time to spare before the tour moved on, but I didn't want to take the chance. Even from my vantage point lower on the hill, the views were pretty spectacular. The trail itself was varied and interesting and a pleasant way to move through the landscape. There were even some Connemara ponies present along some sections of the pathway. It's really nice to, to walk around and uh, yeah, outside of the city where we live, so that's a good, uh, good area. It was really beautiful and it was really nice to have a walk and uh, enjoy the view. Connemara is one of six national parks in Ireland. It covers around 5,000 acres. There is no entry fee for the park. Access to the park for me was the little village of Letterfrack. 
Being able to spend a little time walking about the village was one reason I didn't do the full hike on Diamond Hill. The village didn't disappoint. There were a number of businesses clustered around the main intersections. Walking outside of that area provided a look at what life is like in a typical Irish village. There were the buildings, the roads, and as always, some structures that have been abandoned. In one spot, there was a short little path. It wasn't necessarily a nature trail, but instead just a cut through to get from one place to another. Nice, nonetheless. I stopped into Molly's Pub, and it was early enough on a Sunday to have the whole place and a pint to myself. Both coming and going to the park, the tour stopped in several places of interest. One was the bridge that was used in an old John Wayne movie made in the 1950s, The Quiet Man. At another stop, members of the tour were greeted by a herd of hungry goats. The exchange of food made both the givers and the receivers very happy. Most of the other stops gave everyone a few moments to enjoy particularly gorgeous scenery and vistas. These little moments added to all of the other attractions helped to solidify in my mind the fact that Ireland, especially Western Ireland, was one of the most special places on the planet. Others feel the same way. I used to live three months in Dublin, so I really like and was really happy to come back. Everything is sweet, it's really, yeah, really beautiful. The natural beauty of Ireland is one thing, but the history and aesthetics of its cities are another. I was only in Dublin a short time, but what I saw was magnificent. Take this spot as an example. It is the Christ Church Cathedral. The church was created here in 1030, meaning that it will soon be celebrating its 1000th year. One of the oldest structures in the city, it was founded by the King of the Dublin Norsemen in what was then a medieval Viking settlement. Over the years, this has grown into a magnificent cathedral that attracts tourists and still hosts regular services. I also enjoyed the campus of Trinity College. Officially, the name is the College of the Holy and Undivided Trinity of Queen Elizabeth near Dublin. It was founded by Queen Elizabeth I in 1592 and exists as Ireland's oldest university. The buildings and the architecture are amazing. It's like a 47-acre refuge right in the heart of Dublin. Many tourists walk onto campus grounds to marvel at the place. It struck me that it must be a little otherworldly for the students who are coming here for an education and simply looking for that university experience. I stayed outside of Dublin in the seaside town of Bray. It was beautiful in its own way, and I enjoyed the scene and how different it was from the big city. The two were separated by just a 35-minute train ride. Galway is where I spent the majority of my time in Ireland. I really liked this compact city that was extremely walkable. There were parts of town right along Galway Bay with plenty of boats, both active and no longer in service. There were also some pretty little canals in places with businesses and residences situated alongside of them. It was nice to get away from the busy streets and walk alongside these canals for a bit. The city is the site where the River Corb flows into Galway Bay after a long journey of six kilometers. Six kilometers, which makes this one of the shortest rivers in all of Europe. Surprisingly, the river is up to 94 feet deep and it has one of the fastest flow rates in the country. It was really rolling almost all of the time. On the banks of the Corb River is one of Galway's most famous attractions. The Spanish Arch was one of several arches built in this location in 1584. Some of the others were destroyed in a tsunami in the mid-18th century. The name comes from the days of trade with Spain. It's said that Christopher Columbus stopped here years before he made his trip to the New World and more than a century before the arches were constructed. The Spanish Arch firmly ties Galway to its rich past and provides people today with a place to gather and to commemorate with photos. The arches were part of an extension of the city walls which date back to the 11th century. Part of that wall still stands just a short distance from the arch. This part of town is known as the Latin Quarter. It is the heart of the city and the area where every visitor eventually lands. There are a number of pedestrian-only streets in the area. Key Street is the most famous. Whenever the weather is nice, this place is packed with tourists and residents. For good reason, too. 
In addition to the numerous places to shop, there are over 50 places to eat. Maybe even more importantly, there are 15 bars, most of them what you would consider traditional Irish pubs. I wandered into more than one of these establishments. For a less crowded experience, it's just a short walk to Galway's West End. There are pubs and restaurants and shops here as well. There's just a fraction of the number of people though. One of my favorite places was a bit of a hike outside of town. It was the Salt Hill Promenade. That's a walkway that runs for about five kilometers. It hugs the edge of Galway Bay and plays host to runners, walkers, and dogs throughout the day. This is where I did my walk each morning. Finally, I'll mention Air Square. It's a popular gathering spot today and has been since medieval times when markets were held on this land. Air Square is officially named John F. Kennedy Memorial Park as he gave a speech here in 1963, not long before he was assassinated. The square is home to flags, flowers, artwork, and historical displays. Definitely worth a visit, as is all of Ireland. I've had a wonderful time in Ireland, and it was fun taking this trip with family and friends. Now though, it's time to begin the alone part of my journey. I fly from here two time zones east to Sofia, Bulgaria. I'll be spending 30 days in the capital city. Come back next time to see how I handle the new surroundings and the reality of being old, alone, and far from home. <laughs>